Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. BCN's Angela Stewart has the latest on the Coots border crossing and what traffic is being allowed through. We also have an update on the Freedom Convoy taking place in Ottawa and we hear if the truckers will be leaving anytime soon. And as tensions continue to rise between Russia and Ukraine, U.S. President Joe Biden has the strongest warning yet for Russian President Vladimir Putin. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. The Alberta government announced on Tuesday that it is dropping a number of its COVID-19 mandates. The Restrictions Exemption Program or Vaccine Passport is being removed. Premier Jason Kenney says restrictions on food and beverages and entertainment venues will be removed as well. Capacity limits have been removed except at large venues. Now effective February 14th, there will not be a masking requirement for kids 12 and under and no masking requirements for children in schools for any age. Stage two will begin March 1st and that includes no more indoor mask wearing. Remaining school requirements will be removed. Youth screening will no longer be required for entertainment and sporting events. As of March 1st, the capacity limits will be lifted for all large venues. The limits on indoor and outdoor gatherings will be lifted, as will the mandatory work from home mandate. That too will come to an end. Premier Jason Kenney says the key is having hospitalizations continue to trend down. Kenney says the restrictions exemption program has done its job for Albertans. It is no longer leading to higher vaccination rates. In fact, we, we have seen our vaccination rates effectively frozen since early December. And so our approach to COVID must change as the disease changes. And I believe that's exactly why the Chief Medical Officer for Canada, Dr. Tam, uh, recommended earlier this week that provinces re-examine programs like their proof of vaccination programs. Premier Kenny says stage three date is yet to be determined. It would include protocols being lifted in continuing care facilities and people no longer being required to isolate. Organizers of the Freedom Convoy held an emergency press conference explaining how long they'll remain in Ottawa as the trucker protest is getting close to two weeks now. A spokesperson for the group, Tom Morazzo, says they're hoping for a peaceful resolution and he doesn't understand why Prime Minister Justin Trudeau won't talk with the truckers. I want to go home. But I'm not. I'm not going until I'm, I'm no longer needed here. And based on all the support that we have from the, the people of Canada, I have an incredible amount of support and a lot of people that seem to want me here. And I'm not going home until the job is done. Okay? I am not calling for violence. I'm not expecting you to get into your vehicle, drive here, and, and create uh, problems, create crimes. Okay, that's not what we're saying. Strength in numbers. We got sent here to send a message. The message isn't getting through. He's not getting it. And I apologize if I'm bashing the guy, but honestly, from my assessment, he's got a, a, a 22 caliber mind in a 357 world. Okay? Let's get at a table for God's sakes. Enough hiding. I'm willing, I'm willing to sit at a table with the Conservatives and the NDP and the Bloc as a coalition. I'll sit with the Governor General. You put me at somebody, put us at the table with somebody that actually cares about Canada. Political reporter Brian Lilly says organizers with the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa have to be a little more realistic with their demands, including having Justin Trudeau removed as Prime Minister. Mr. Lilly says outside of an election, it's not easy removing a sitting Prime Minister. They've got this um, memorandum of understanding that makes zero sense and claims that they can remove Justin Trudeau from office by forming a coalition with the opposition parties, with the Senate and the Governor General. And, and there's other stuff being passed around saying we can force a vote of non-confidence. No, you can't. You can't contact the Attorney General, who is a cabinet minister in the Trudeau government, and force a, uh, a, a vote of non-confidence. Mr. Lilly will also talk about the alleged mistakes that the Ottawa police chief made in the handling of the Freedom Convoy. That interview is coming up later in our broadcast. BCN video journalist Naveen Day and BCN producer Michael Clausen are in Ottawa covering the Freedom Convoy. Gentlemen, you say something unusual recently took place in our nation's capital. In the wake of the, of the uh, state of emergency being declared, orders were issued upon police to confiscate uh, fuel and supplies that were 
that could be used to aid the truckers. And so what's, uh, what the protesters did in response is that thousands of them went out and bought jerry cans and filled them up with water to act as decoys. And the police couldn't confiscate those because people were showing receipts as, uh, as proof of ownership. And uh, police can't, uh, can't confiscate uh, private property when there's no warrants. So that's how they were getting, they, they were getting around that. But uh, the biggest news was, uh, was a press conference with the yeah. organizers of the Freedom Convoy uh, that we were invited to. And Michael, why don't you, why don't you tell our viewers more about that? Yeah, so they were, they were kind, of, kind enough to invite Bridge City News there. And uh, we were very grateful, you know, to be front and center for the press conference from last night. If you missed it, it's still on our Instagram. So please head over to Instagram, check out Bridge City News there. And share it. And share it. Please share it. So the whole point of this meeting last night was to use social media and the people with cameras on the ground outside of the leg legacy media to share the, the path forward and the plans that the convoy leadership has. And I feel, uh, just before I hand it back to you, I feel that it was uh, to present the path forward and also to calm emotions amongst the people that are here. Right, now uh, something else that, that came up that was a little bit more disturbing uh, that we, we heard from truckers and heard from the organizers is that there is a possible move to, uh, to dissolve the convoy. Authorities may be dissolving this thing on Friday, but with that there could also be a potential blackout of the media and yeah. disabling of our cell phones. Yeah. Thanks so much, gentlemen. That was BCN's Naveen Day and Michael Clausen joining us from the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa. Now, our poll question is, do you support the Freedom Convoy taking place in our nation's capital? Make sure you log on to our website, bridgecitynews.ca, and let us know your thoughts. We shall tabulate the results and have them for you on a future broadcast. The trucker protest continues along the Coots border crossing, but lanes have reopened and the traffic is moving smoothly. BC and video journalist Angela Stewart is at Coots and has the latest. Angela? So when this blockade started about 11 days ago, Highway 4 was jam-packed with truckers and supporters. By the looks of things, that doesn't really seem to be the case anymore. I'm going to flip you around so you can get a better view of what I'm talking about. I'm sitting in my car right now because it's so windy, but there are still trucks parked on each side of the highway. When we go over to this side, there are tractors and farm equipment. Uh, they are still making their presence known down here at Coots. Um, making my way down to the village here, I had to make my way through two police checkpoints. The first one was right outside of Milk River. An RCMP officer uh, told me there, the only people who would be able to get down to Coots here are the locals who live in the village or those truckers that are transporting livestock who don't have uh, time to go to another border or media who are covering this story. And the second uh, checkpoint is just before the village, I would say about 16 kilometers uh, just before you hit the village. That's where most of the truckers and supporters are, par uh, are parked um, as they aren't able to get through the police barricade. Once you get down to Coots here, there is one lane open heading southbound and northbound. And RCMP are also now reporting that commercial and uh, passenger vehicles who are heading north are able to cross the Coots border freely, but those who are heading south are being asked to go to a different border like Carway or Del Benita. Other than that, it's fairly quiet down here at Coots. Thanks so much, Angela. That was BCN video journalist Angela Stewart reporting from the Coots border. Now, RCMP say they will be taking further action to put an end to the protest at the Coots border. Police say they want to resolve the situation down at the border in a safe and peaceful way, but they've seen activity happen that is dangerous and reckless. Deputy Commissioner Curtis Ablocki says they plan to press charges. Make no mistake, there are illegal activities taking place at these protest sites that violate both criminal code and provincial laws. We are investigating, there will be charges, and this does not end when the road is cleared. Our investigations began when the illegal activity began, and we'll work with our investigative power using all of the tools we have available. Zablocki so says RCMP have asked towing companies to assist in removing the trucks, but so far, many of the companies have said, no chance. 
Lisa Silver, an associate professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Calgary, says there's a broad range of regulatory and criminal offenses that protesters at the Coots border could be subjected to. Now, these include violating the Traffic Safety Act, commercial vehicles subjected to inspection, and small charges, which includes the honking of horns. A charge of intimidation under the criminal code could also be given out with an indictable offense of five years or a summary conviction of a year. But intimidation is where someone, for the purpose of compelling another person to abstain from doing anything uh, that he or she has the lawful right to do, blocks or obstructs a highway. So you can imagine that, that it's possible that that charge could be out there because you know people are trying to get through the border and that may obstruct a highway, that may stop them from doing something that they have a lawful right to do. There's currently one lane of traffic flowing freely at the trucker rally taking place at the Coots border crossing. Well, the gusty winds have died down somewhat in our region and the warm temperatures continue. Jeanette Rocher is here with a quick peek at the forecast. Jeanette, how long will these double digit plus temperatures continue in southwestern Alberta? Well, for most of the week, actually, hell, they will be. As we look into tomorrow, we're seeing those teen temperatures of 13 degrees. We're going to be even seeing higher temperatures after that, up to 15 degrees. As far as those gusty winds go, yeah, for the most part, the majority of them are over. However, uh, we're still experiencing those 60 to 70 kilometer per hour wind gusts. Much better, much less intense than what we were experiencing at the 110K, uh, where we had that wind warning in effect. No more of that for now anyways. Uh, we are going to still see those gusts up to 70K, though, like I said. I'll have a more in-depth look at this week's weather coming up later on in the show. A virtual memorial to honor missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is taking place next week in Lethbridge. Pictures and names will be displayed at Lethbridge City Hall to honor many of the victims. As Micah Quinn explains now, organizers say the virtual memorial is a serious call to action. We want to start a dialogue and make our community aware that this is a local issue um, and we do need to take action. The City of Lethbridge, the Reconciliation Lethbridge Advisory Committee and the Blood Tribe Department of Health are working together to host a virtual memorial to honour missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. We're partnering with the Kainai Wellness uh, and the Blood Tribe Department of Health. Um, they have a support group. Uh, for families of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. So a lot of their participants have been uh, sharing their stories with us as well, as well as local uh, participants and families as well. The virtual memorial will take place on February 14th from 5 to 8 p.m. And the names and photos of loved ones will be displayed on the side of City Hall for motorists to see as they make their way past Stafford Drive. And one thing we really wanted to do this year is to acknowledge that this is not just a Canadian-wide issue. This is happening here in Lethbridge and in our communities. So we really want to, to um, reach you know, our communities at, at that level. In 2020, a list of 25 recommendations was brought to Lethbridge City Council. And one of these calls to actions is to advocate and bring awareness to our missing and murdered women and girls. City administration will be providing an update to the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Work Plan to the Standing Policy Committee on February 17th. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Now that Pierre Polyev has put his name forward as a leadership candidate for the federal Conservatives, he may want to be careful about attending any future truck rallies. Now that's according to retired University of Lethbridge political science professor Dr. Jeffrey Hale. Dr. Hale says by attending these protests, it could end up costing him or any other CPC candidate big time. If the leaders are seen to be encouraging lawlessness, uh, not only will Mr. Trudeau or Ms. Freeland try to hang it on them in the next election, but they will invite other groups from the other end of the political spectrum to do exactly the same thing to them uh, should they ever win an election. Make sure you catch the full interview with Dr. Hale and BCN's Jeanette Rocher discussing the conservative leadership race that's coming up after business news. Around 80 people were ticketed in Calgary on Monday as a Freedom Convoy stalled morning rush hour in the Stampede City. The slow rolling protests frustrated morning commuters on various roadways, including Deerfoot Trail, but fortunately there were no serious incidents. Police say around 20 vehicles also blocked two lanes of traffic along McLeod Trail and 4th Avenue. Now there were similar demonstrations held over the weekend in surrounding communities including Airdrie, Cochrane and Okotoks. People in Saskatchewan will soon no longer have to show vaccine passports. 
Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe says he's lifting COVID-19 restrictions on Monday. Moe says the benefits of providing proof of vaccination against the virus to enter businesses, including restaurants, no longer outweighs the costs. It's also time for the proof of vaccination mandate to end. So effective at midnight this Sunday, February the 13th, all provincial proof of vaccination requirements will end. In Saskatchewan businesses, in venues and provincially regulated workplaces, this means that the proof of vaccination or the negative test option that we had provided will no longer be a provincial requirement. Starting on Valentine's Day, February the 14th, um, this will be the case. This will leave one remaining COVID measure in place, and that is indoor masking. That measure remains in effect until the end of February. Mo says by the end of February, his province will also lift the indoor mask wearing mandate. A protest against COVID-19 restrictions continues in front of the Manitoba Legislature. Winnipeg police say organizers have cooperated in allowing a nearby street to reopen for rush hour. More than a dozen large vehicles remained on site and are blocking the main entrance to the legislature grounds. Vehicles began parking there on Friday in tandem with others across the country protesting COVID-19 mandates. A Freedom Convoy protest caused a long traffic backup along the Ambassador Bridge that connects Windsor to Detroit. It's the busiest border crossing between Canada and the United States. Canada's public safety minister told American officials to stay out of Canada's business as prominent Republicans have offered their support to the trucker convoy. U.S. President Joe Biden is encouraging North Americans and other essential diplomats to leave Ukraine amid Russian military threat. He also warns Russian President Vladimir Putin it would be a big mistake to invade its neighbor. I think he has to realize that it would be a gigantic mistake for him to move on Ukraine. The impact on Europe and the rest of the world would be devastating and he would pay a heavy price. I have been very, very straightforward and blunt with President Putin, both on the phone and in person. We will impose the most severe sanctions that have ever been imposed, economic sanctions. And there will be a lot to pay for that in, uh, down the road. It will affect others as well. It will affect us somewhat, it will affect Europeans, but it will have profound impact on his economy. Canada's Michael Kinsbury won silver in men's moguls at the Beijing Olympics. That's his third Olympic medal. The most decorated mogul skier in the world arrived as reigning champion, but lost to Sweden's Walter Wahlberg in the superfinal. It's amazing. I know they're supporting me since day one. and uh, Yeah, I know they were there. They were with me. I actually put all their name in my helmet um, because I knew, you know, they, they weren't going to be here in Beijing and I wanted to compete and I know they were going to be with me. Um, so... Yeah, it's, it's awesome when you get the chance to, to chat uh, to them after, right after the event. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of what I've done. And yeah, it was a, a beautiful phone call. And yeah, I miss, I miss my girlfriend. I miss uh, my family, my friends. And I can't wait to go home and, and, and share that medal with them. Congratulations, Mr. Kinsbury. That's incredible. By the way, the Beijing Winter Olympics continue through February 20th. Well, it's felt anything like winter here, anything but winter. The mild temperatures continue in and around our city, and the warmer weather will be sticking around for some time. Full weather details are on deck. We had some strong winds again today across much of southwestern Alberta. Jeanette Roche is back with a full look at the weather forecast. Jeanette, the milder temperatures may be sticking around for some time. Will we get close to breaking any records? I mean, after all, this is February and this is incredible. You know, it really has held. The past two days I've been able to go outside without my jacket on, just a sweater. And, uh, you know, I love that for February. But you had asked about record breakers, and I am keeping my eye on Thursday here uh, with an expected high of 15 degrees. Uh, the record on that day was actually 13.3 degrees. So we got to keep our eye on that to see if we're going to break a record this Thursday. Other than that, we are looking at a high of 13 degrees on Wednesday with a mix of sun and cloud, about 60 kilometer per hour winds. 
Thursday, there's that sunshine and 15 degrees down to one degree on Friday with a mix of sun and cloud back up to seven degrees with sunshine on Saturday and 11 degrees on Sunday and back to seven degrees on Monday. I mean, you know, we're having that little dip in the middle of the week there, but we're always above zero, which was the average high for this time of year. So I'll take it. Minus 12, the average low. 19, that's where we were at back in 1954. And in 1994, we had our chilliest day on record, which was minus 34 right there. 7.55 is when the sun rose this morning. The sun set this evening at 5.36 p.m., giving us just a little under 10 hours of daylight, about 9 hours and 45 minutes. So on the West Coast tomorrow, a high of 8 degrees in Victoria. Uh, Vancouver looking at a 30% chance of drizzle and 8 degrees. 8 degrees also in Edmonton tomorrow with 20 kilometer per hour winds. 12 degrees in Calgary with lots of sunshine and also 20 kilometer per hour winds, not bad at all. I would not even call that a Chinook for Calgary. In uh, Saskatoon, looking at a high of one degree, 30% a chance of flurries there tomorrow. Minus three, the high in Regina with a mix of sun and cloud, 20K winds. Now, Winnipeg, that's where we're gonna see more wind gusts up to 50K, a high of uh, minus 11, gonna be feeling like minus 15 by the afternoon. In Toronto, risk of freezing rain there, three degrees. One degree the high in Ottawa with a 60% chance of flurries, four showers. Montreal sitting at zero with sunshine. Lots of sunny skies there in Montreal tomorrow. Now, 60% chance of flurries in both Fredericton and Halifax tomorrow. High of two in Fredericton, four degrees the high in Halifax. Charlottetown looking at a two to four centimeters of snow tomorrow in 70 kilometer per hour wind gusts, zero degrees the high. Five degrees the high in St. John's Newfoundland line with a rainfall warning in effect there, looking at 10 to 20 millimeters of rain and wind gusts up to 80 kilometers per hour. So there you have it. That is your forecast. Several grocers across the country are expressing concerns about a surge in shoplifting of food and pharmacy products. A spokesperson with the Canadian Federation of Independent Grocers says data is lacking, however, since retailers often ask suspects to leave the store and not return rather than involve police. Industry experts say meat is the number one stolen item, followed by cheese and then over-the-counter medicine. It's unclear whether the increase in theft is attributed to escalating inflation or a growing resale market for stolen goods. Calgary-based Petronas Energy Canada has announced its chief financial officer will become its next president and CEO. The natural gas company says the appointment of Iswan Ismail is effective April 1st. It says current president and CEO Mark Fitzgerald will transfer to Kuala Lumpur to become the company's vice president of international assets. Fitzgerald has been the CEO of Petronas Energy Canada since November of 2016. A company which has a partnership with Walmart is looking to speed up the process of fully driverless truck operations within the next few years. Gatik CEO Guatam Narang says he sees the future of autonomous trucking in short hauls. Gatik and Walmart together announced a global first, and uh, you know we became the first company to operate uh, in a fully driverless manner uh, on a public road. Uh, in a commercial capacity. So uh, what we are doing in Arkansas with Walmart is operating two of our autonomous box trucks on a 7.1 mile long route um, in a repeated and daily fashion. What we do is uh, move these online grocery orders from one of Walmart's dark store, which is their micro fulfillment center, and move these orders to uh, a nearby retail location where Walmart's end consumer can go and do a curbside pickup. That is pretty cool. Now. Here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 141 points on the day to 21,377. The Dow was up 371 points to 35,462. The S&P 500 was up 37 points to 4,521. And the NASDAQ was also up on the day 178 points to 14,194. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down $1.96 to $89.36 U.S. per barrel. Natural gas was up $0.02 cents to $4.25 U.S. Gold was up $0.07 cents to $18.25.98 U.S. an ounce. And silver was even on the day at $23.18 U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at $12.22 per bushel. Barley's at $9.53. Canola's at $23.20. And corn is at $10.89 per bushel. Live cattle were up 15 cents to 
Feeder cattle were up $1.85 to $166.88, and lean hogs were up $263 to $90.33. The Canadian dollar was even over the past 24 hours at 78.70 US. Recapping one of our top stories, there are reports that 22 protesters have now been arrested at the Freedom Convoy taking place in Ottawa. Ottawa police also issued a statement saying that more than 100 tickets have also been issued related to demonstration enforcement. The rally in support of eliminating all COVID-19 mandates has continued in our nation's capital for 12 days now. Apparently, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau threw a little diesel fuel on the trucker convoy fire during a recent emergency debate on the Freedom Convoy. BCN contributor Brian Lilly will have details for us next. The Freedom Convoy continues in our nation's capital. Thousands of truckers and their supporters continue to camp out downtown Ottawa, where they're not leaving until all of the COVID-19 mandates are lifted. They want their freedoms back, and they're fighting for a lot of Canadians. Now to chat about this in more detail is political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly. Brian, the rally is not only overtaking the Coots border crossing here in Alberta, but now it's also the Ambassador Bridge, which is the main connection between Windsor and Detroit. So we've got Ottawa, we've got here in Alberta, and Windsor and Detroit as well. Yeah, so the blockade for the Ambassador Bridge started to take place on Monday, and it started with slowing down of traffic. Eventually, there was no traffic going back and forth, and it, it's been up and down. So, you know, as you and I are talking right now, there's limited traffic going from the Canadian side to the American side, but no traffic coming in. That's subject to change at any moment. Um, it has been up and down, as I said, throughout the day. The reason that's so important, and this carries a lot more weight than the Coots border crossing, because of numbers, trade. The US government estimates in US dollars, so I found this a stat on a US government site, more than $400 million of two-way, or 400 billion, sorry, 400 billion of two-way trade between Canada and the US each year, 27% of that trade crosses the Ambassador Bridge. So uh, I had one person email me and say, I was at a 1991 shutdown of the uh, Ambassador Bridge, and they said, we were there for a number of hours. Within 12 hours, 16 auto parts plants have closed. There's more auto parts plants along the 401 corridor than there were back then. So, you know, of course, this is going to have a serious economic impact, shutting that down. Far bigger economic impact than you would see from the Ottawa encampment or the Coots border crossing. So, you know, will they get the government's attention? Will this uh, lead to anything? We're going to have to wait and see so far the Trudeau government just saying, well, this is a local Windsor policing issue and a province of Ontario issue because it's just ahead of the line where the federal government um, uh, responsibility and, and land takes effect. Brian, an Ottawa resident won an injunction to stop the honking of the air horns, which apparently been going on night and day. Now, if the protesters actually complied and stopped the honking? But they stopped uh, quite a bit on Monday, is my understanding, and then Tuesday it was back on. Um, you know, the, for people that uh, laugh and say, well, it's just honking. I was around for the Toronto protests in the weekend, and when they're all going at the same time, it is something. And at times these have been in residential neighborhoods, not just the area around Parliament Hill. And so imagine trying to sleep with that. Imagine trying to put your kids to bed with that noise. So it was a young woman, took them to court. She won. Um, the, the honking started up again on Tuesday. It's difficult for anybody to control this. If you remember, the protest organizer said that uh, on Sunday morning, out of respect for uh, the Lord's Day, veterans, uh, the residents of Ottawa, and a whole bunch of other reasons, we're going to not have honking between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. Well, a bunch of the people who were down there decided they weren't going to abide by that, and they started honking. Um, but for the most part, it does appear to be there. And if not, there is an enforcement mechanism for Ottawa police, who, by the way, have been doing a horrible job on this. So I think we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, they'll be able to be given another tool to go in and enforce it. Now, Monday night, there was an emergency debate in the House of Commons discussing the protests taking place in Ottawa. Now, you say instead of trying to defuse the situation, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau actually threw gas on the fire or maybe diesel on the fire, we should say in this case. <laughs> yeah, maybe it is diesel on the fire in this case. Maybe he had a yellow jerry can carried around with him around the hill like we've seen in so many photos. No, he, look, 
the prime minister disagrees with these protesters, and he made it clear when asked last week that he only meets with protesters he agrees with, and he wouldn't be meeting with these group of protesters. Okay, so fine, that's your position. But does he have to escalate the situation all the time? It's difficult. It's tense in Ottawa right now. That's why they had the emergency debate. Could he have said, I understand that everyone wants to get back to normal? He did. He did say that. But he also described everybody who's with this uh, protest movement. He basically tried to convince everyone that they're all Nazis and uh, racists. He cited the Nazi and Confederate flag, you know, one of each showing up on uh, Parliament Hill. The, the swastika flag didn't even get to the Hill, is my understanding, before people who are in the protest chase that person away. So this is a, a regular Trudeau tactic where he seeks to divide. He seeks to, uh, it's very Saul Alinsky-like. He, he, he says, those are the people causing the problems over there. Go get them. And his supporters and followers lap that up. He, he's not trying to bring Canadians together. Remember, this is a man who, when there were violent protests by farmers in India against the Modi government, talked about how there needs to be dialogue and we all need to work together. That was for violent protests in a country that he is not the leader of. And these are not violent protests. Yes, there have been some people and problems and, and arrests and, and charges laid, but most, you know, we're not talking about a violent protest. I've been in violent protests in the nation's capital. He is dismissive of Canadians while trying to say to uh, Punjabi farmers that he has their backs. Why? It, it always comes down to votes for Justin Trudeau. And he was trying to court a certain ethnic voting bloc here in Canada with those comments, with the comments about the trucking convoy. He's trying to gin up his base and get them angry at the people out in front of Parliament. It's interesting when I was listening to the Prime Minister using words like those people didn't Don Cherry get into trouble for saying you people at one point in time and he lost his job? That's quite interesting, you know, that take. Now, Brian, Quebec Liberal MP Joel Lightbound says his leader, Justin Trudeau, is taking quite the divisive tone. He's actually coming out against where his own government is standing. That was a fascinating turn of events on Tuesday morning because, you know, just the night before, Candace Bergen, the interim conservative leader, had stated in, at the beginning of her first question to Trudeau during the emergency debate that the country's more divided than it's ever been. And Trudeau, oh, no, it's not. And look at all the Canadians who have gotten vaccinated and we are united, but other than those people. Uh, and then Lightbound came out, who has been a a, a Trudeau liberal through and through. He was first elected in 2015. Um, he, he's part, he used to be a parliamentary secretary. He came out and said, the country's more divided than it's ever been. And he's worried about the divisive tone of the government that he is a part of. He's worried about the direction the prime minister is taking us in. And he said, I'm not calling for all mandates to end right now because I'm not a doctor and I'm not an epidemiologist, but people are hurting. And they need to know and see a way out of this. And my government right now is not providing that. They're providing the opposite. So fascinated to see what will happen with him. Um, you know, will he be kicked out of the Liberal caucus, which seemed to be the only thing that the uh, parliamentary press gallery was interested in. I'm more interested in his ideas, which, quite honestly, he could have lifted his speech out of any number of a half dozen columns I've written over the last little while on the nature of this government and how we need to start listening to people uh, who are saying it's time to move on. Now, Ottawa Police Chief Peter Slowly has been criticized for letting the protest get as big as it has in Ottawa. Apparently, the chief never thought the protesters would stay beyond the first Sunday. Now, didn't the protesters actually contact the police saying, we're here for the long haul? Well, he says that whoever he was speaking with told them that they're there for three days. But anybody that watched the Facebook videos that were posted, that interviewed anybody associated with the protests, that listened to the information those driving to Ottawa had put out, heard the same message over and over again. We're coming to Ottawa. We're not leaving until we get all of our demands met. Uh, that is a failure of intelligence, a failure of understanding by Chief Peter Slowly. Now, I will point out that when he was hired, the uh, Ottawa City Council, Mayor Jim Watson, the Police Services Board, they loved him because he was going to bring, quote unquote, progressive policing to the nation's capital. Um, slowly, he'd come out of the Toronto uh, Police Service. He rose as high as deputy chief, but was passed over for chief. 
left, went to the private sector, and then was hired by Ottawa to bring progressive policing to the city. Right now, residents of Ottawa seem to want a very unprogressive reaction to the protest. They want people arrested and heads smashed and, you know, the old fashioned go in and uh, people in riot gear. So it's fascinating to watch this happen. Uh, slowly has failed from the beginning. So has the city on being able to control this. Because right now, it's the protesters who are in control of the core of the nation's capital, which has to be an embarrassment. I mean, they, the city couldn't remove them if they wanted to without a massive show of force. And that's problematic and it shows poor planning from the beginning. Brian, there doesn't appear to be any direct engagement between the protesters and any level of government. Why is that? Basically, only the police appear to be talking to them. Um, but, you know, Mayor Jim Watson has been hiding out in his home in the west end of Ottawa, um, doing Skype calls and chastising people. Um, he has, uh, I, I thought at the beginning that this might resurrect his damaged political career. You may have heard he's got a problem with a, an LRT train system that doesn't work properly, that's severely damaged him. But I thought, oh, well, you know, people will be happy with how he's handling this protest. It, it, you know, it'll repair his, his reputation. It hasn't. Uh, Premier Doug Ford is uh, basically saying it's up to Ottawa and it's up to the federal government because it's a, a protest on parliament. And as we just discussed, the, the prime minister is throwing gasoline on the fire. Uh, there have been some talks, apparently, where, you know, we've seen conservative MPs go out and, and meet with people. That's about the extent of it. And I don't know if, if your end goal is to say, OK, we need the nation's capital back. We can't have trucks parked forever in front of parliament. But don't you go out and talk to people? Doesn't there have to be engagement at some point? You know, we're willing to talk to countries that we're actually enemies with. You should talk to your uh, fellow Canadians. And you know, some people have said, yes, but these guys want to overthrow the government. Well, they don't want to violently overthrow the government. They've got this um, memorandum of understanding that makes zero sense and claims that they can remove Justin Trudeau from office by forming a coalition with the opposition parties, with the Senate and the governor general. And, and there's other stuff being passed around saying we can force a vote of non-confidence. No, you can't. You can't contact the attorney general, who is a cabinet minister in the Trudeau government enforce a, uh, a vote of non-confidence. That aside, you know, they're looking to change the way government's operating. That doesn't mean you can't talk to them. Like I said, if we're going to talk to countries that are actually enemies of Canada and, and call for engagement, then why wouldn't we talk to our fellow Canadians? It's baffling unless you look at it at the lens of partisan politics, which is how Prime Minister Justin Trudeau looks at everything. And these Canadians are taxpayers, which are helping to pay your salary, public officials. Brian, the other big story is that various public health officials are saying we need to move past restrictions and re-examine vaccine mandates and passports. In fact, the Alberta government is looking at potentially scrapping the vaccine passports very soon. Do you think medical people and politicians are really communicating enough right now? No, they're definitely not. And when Joel Lightbound came out with his um, his plea for the government to change the way they're doing things, he kept citing Dr. Teresa Tam, who's been the most uh, cautious, the least um, open to reopening society all through the pandemic, as various provincial health officers have made moves to loosen restrictions at times, she has warned against that. And yet last Friday was saying, we need to re-examine everything, especially in light of Omicron because it's everywhere. And while the vaccine will protect you from uh, serious uh, uh, outcomes, such as going to the hospital or heaven forbid dying, it doesn't protect you from becoming infected and spreading it to others. So why have a vaccine passport? Why continue with vaccine mandates? Um, you know, so you've got provincial health officials saying this, you've got Dr. Tam saying this. Meanwhile, the Trudeau government is actually looking at bringing in a, a mandate that says any trucker that crosses a provincial border must be fully vaccinated. So, you know, when, when they shut the international border, they said, well, you can still drive within Canada. But now they want to say, but only within your province. It's, it's madness here in the city of Toronto. They're looking at bringing in a, um, a, a mandate for cab drivers, even though most cab drivers, like 90% of them, are already vaccinated. So, you know, it seems like politicians continue to look for ways to punish those who aren't doing what they want, while medical officials are saying, okay, 
it's time to change how we're dealing with this. It's time to move on. Brian, the Conservative Party of Canada now has Manitoba MP Candace Bergen at the helm as interim leader. What's the process of actually choosing a new permanent leader? And is Pierre Polyev the front runner? Well, Pierre Polyev would be the front runner because he's the only officially declared candidate at this point. So, you know, in a race of one, Pierre's out front. And he also smartly announced before anybody else and then had a string of endorsements ready to be announced as soon as he made his uh, his wishes known. But they still haven't set the terms. So they have to decide, is it going to be a, a three month, a six month, a 12 month leadership uh, race? When will it be? What What's the, the fee to get in? All of that has to be decided. So far, Polyev is the name in. Uh, Tasha Kiridin, who is a uh, 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 sometime uh, columnist with the National Post, has floated on Twitter that she is thinking about running because she has been asked by several people to, to consider. Um, Quebec MP Alan Reyes has said that he has approached Jean Charest to run. Peter McKay is said to be kicking the tires. We're not sure about uh, who else might jump in, but there is a lot of interest. That's good for the party. I don't think it's going to be a coronation for uh, Pierre Polyev. Could he win handily if there's a race? Sure, he could. But my point being, I don't think that it's going to be only one person and everyone else is exclu excluded. This is still a viable par party. This is still a party that could become the next government. The idea that nobody wants the job, just obviously from the names I've just given, isn't true. Political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Hal. Well, it's been a crazy couple of weeks with the trucker convoys and anti-vax mandate protests and the ousting of federal conservative leader Aaron O'Toole. Joining us to discuss this is Dr. Jeffrey Hale, Professor Emeritus in Political Science with the University of Lethbridge. Welcome back to Bridge City News again, Dr. Hale. So great to have you. Thank you for having me. So, Dr. Hale, the final vote tally from the Conservative caucus was 73 to 45 to oust Aaron O'Toole as party leader. So did that margin surprise you at all? Uh, really, the, the vote depended on which way the large centre group of caucus went. Uh, Mr. O'Toole has had his critics for some time, uh, both before and particularly since the last federal election. Uh, he has a group of loyalists, whether on pragmatic or ideological grounds, and uh, there is a group in the middle that wasn't anxious to make a change, but uh, felt that uh, Mr. O'Toole had uh, basically uh, outstayed his effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Did that margin surprise you, though, like how many people wanted him out compared to those who were staying loyal to him? The reports that were going the rounds suggested at least 60 people were willing to vote uh, to replace him. Uh, one never puts too much stock to these numbers because there's always a certain amount of spin to them. But I think this was an indication that the, the center group in the caucus had had enough and uh, felt a change was needed. And, and um, that's not inconsistent with, with, with some reports that were going around. Mm, interesting. Okay, so there's a lot of talk that this was just disgruntled social conservatives that were against O'Toole, but with those numbers, it must be more widespread than that, obviously, as you sort of alluded to there. What, what were the reasons that MPs voted him out? Well, I think a number of the people who supported O'Toole as their first choice for the leadership, not as the uh, consensus alternative, uh, were the ones who made the difference in this vote. Uh, and I think part of it was a reflection of his um, the weaknesses in his communication skills, uh, the fact that he was not very good at staying on message. He couldn't craft a measured position and stick with it. He kept gyrating back and forth across the spectrum. Uh, there were problems in communicating with caucus members. Uh, being an opposition leader is a difficult job. It gets more difficult when you take your supporters for granted. And uh, there were some suggestions that Mr. O'Toole was doing just that. Uh, you add those things together and, uh, and uh, 
uh, basically it's act now or wait out the next election. And I don't think there was a great deal of confidence that Mr. O'Toole had uh, learned enough from the last election to be as competitive as the caucus wanted in the next one. So do you think after the O'Toole reign, caucus will want to shift more to the right of center, or is there still an appetite for that centrist approach? Uh, well, ultimately, caucus will not make the decision. It will depend on who gets out and mobilizes large numbers of uh, conservatives, fellow tra travelers, interest group members, and whoever else wants to plunk down $10 or $15 to buy a conservative membership. Uh, that is the way the game is played these days. And so uh, there are about 100 seats where there is no functioning conservative party, and uh, those are, those are uh, vulnerable to takeovers from very special interest groups. Uh, Mr. O'Toole played the gun lobby very effectively the last time, and he made the mistake of, um, of dropping them in the middle of the election campaign. And my experience of those folks is that they have long memories and uh, aren't terribly forgiving of being double-crossed. Uh, the, uh, the dairy farmers obviously have played a significant role in Quebec and, and uh, we'll see which of the possible candidates line up with them or against them, uh, or if anybody wants to take on that lobby, given the uh, relative weakness of the Conservative Party in Quebec. And uh, the, the, the last two election leadership elections I've looked at, uh, members are effective in recruiting, uh, voters are recruiting members for the Conservative Party if particular leadership candidates resonate in their areas. Uh, if they're out of tune with their constituents, they can't deliver the goods quite typically. Mm -hmm. Interesting point there. So now, of course, it appears as though Pierre Polyev is the early favorite to replace O'Toole. Who else do you think that, that we can expect will likely enter this race? Uh, I think we will see at least one other uh, center-left um, candidate from... Uh, Ontario or Quebec. I'm not sure if it'll be Michael Chong or Jean Charest or some other candidate who is trying to stake out a position. Uh, the number of people who can be competitive in a national race are relatively small, uh, but Mr. Chong has uh, shown himself to be a credible individual who, uh, well, he may not uh, agree with uh, many members of the party, treats them with civility and thoughtfulness and that's, uh, that's always an advantage in a, as in a leadership candidate in a divided party. Uh, Mr. Shadek carries a little more baggage. Uh, he's been around since the Mulroney years. Uh, that would, I think, tend to weigh against him. But uh, the, the Montreal and Toronto establishments need somebody to run. So it will be interesting to see who they can persuade to, to carry their banner. Uh, uh, I don't know if Michelle Rempel uh, Garner is uh, is uh, interested in running this time, or if she will bide her time until after you know until another future race. Uh, Leslin Lewis's name has been kicked around. I'm not sure whether uh, she is up for another run or if she wants to to uh, establish herself uh, as a House of Commons player uh, and not just the um, the spokesperson for uh, part of the conser social conservative wing of the party. These are some of the names that are being kicked around, but we'll have to see because the leadership organizing committee has not come out with the rules for the race. It has not come out with any uh, ideas as to how much money they are going to extract from prospective candidates. Last time they asked for $300,000 as a, as a, as a deposit and that chased off an awful lot of people. You don't want the bar so low that everybody and his dog can run. You don't want the bar so high that you discourage people with potential, but who have to get themselves out in front of the membership before they can raise significant sums of money. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. It'll be interesting to see what happens for sure. Now, any thoughts on who the new conservative leader will be actually running against in the next federal election? Will it be Justin Trudeau again? Or could it be someone like Christian Freeland? Because that may be an important factor as to who conservatives should be voting for. 
Uh, these are interesting questions, uh, and obviously it's not in the government's an uh, interest to give anybody an answer this far away from a prospective election. We assume the government has at least another 18 months in its mandate. Um, uh, we will see uh, whether Christopher Freeland is able to come up with two budgets that would uh, address some of the very real challenges the country is facing as a result of not just the pandemic, but the changing economic environment broadly. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Trudeau, it's Mr. Trudeau's job as long as he wants it. Uh, uh, he, he doesn't strike me as being in a Jean Chrétien type of position of having lost control of the party organization. Uh, but um, it's never a good idea to be seen uh, holding the knife uh, where, if, when there is a, uh, an involuntary uh, transfer power. Okay. Uh, now, some are hoping for a shorter election, a leadership election, while others suggest that it would, it would be better to maybe stretch it out a bit longer. I would guess that a shorter time would maybe favor sitting MPs as opposed to outsiders. Any thoughts on the pros and cons on the length of the campaign? Very much so. Uh, realistically, uh, in a minority government situation, you need to give uh, the next leader uh, time to uh, establish a team, recruit new candidates, get the party's fundraising operation back into shape. Uh, so September seems like a reasonable time. You, June is the, uh, uh, will overlap with a, an Ontario provincial election in which Doug Ford will be running for his life. So a lot of organizers in Ontario will want the party to stay out of that window. Uh, October is a Quebec election, uh, not as critical for uh, for the party, but but certainly a courtesy. You don't want to be uh, you don't want to be trying to communicate with uh, conservative voters in Quebec uh, if you have an election campaign running. So, I would think something in the first half of September might be a possibility. Uh, yes, that does give sitting MPs a. Um, an advantage over outsiders. Uh, there are a handful of people who uh, might have uh, access to leadership teams that they can reorgan, you know, that they can energize within that time frame. But uh, given the fact that there's a 21 day cutoff on memberships, uh, you know, that is taking us to the end of August. And, uh, and I think I think the, the leadership organizing committee recognized from 2019 that letting things stretch out indefinitely was not a great idea. So um, the, uh, I think I think we will see it. I think we will see it in September. Okay. And of course, whoever ends up in that position, they'll be faced with a difficult task, of course, to heal the rifts and bring about some sense of unity. So what does that new leader need to do to do that? Well, the I think first of all you have to be civil to all parts of the party uh, and treat people with respect. If you don't treat people with respect uh, while you're seeking their support, uh, there's a very small chance that you will be able to carry that support into an election, and that applies wherever you fit on the spectrum. Uh, secondly, you have to avoid giving hostages to fortune. Justin Trudeau. Uh, will take advantage of uh, any indisip message in discipline uh, of candidates during this leadership race. Uh, so you cannot be caught saying things that are so far out of touch with what you want to say in an election campaign that you, in effect, destroy your credibility either by pivoting as fast as Aaron O'Toole did by being... Um, caught in a crossfire because of the tactics you use to win the leadership. So uh, these are uh, these are basics and they're, 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 they're a test of the political skills of uh, those who will be running for office. Um, now, Dr. Hale, you kind of suggested that we won't see that election for at least another six months or so. So, um, but hypothetically speaking, how do you think the new leader should address this whole anti-vax mandate protest and freedom rally. Uh, this could potentially be stumbling blocks or great opportunities to bring about change. This is a tremendous challenge for the leader because you do not want to leave too much room for Maxime Bernier, uh, who, whose party took 
uh, took it perhaps 10 seats away from the Conservatives by splitting the vote during the last federal election. Uh, by the same token, the way you deal with very disruptive protests will be the way that you invite your political opponents to disrupt you should you ever uh, run for public office. Uh, it's known as what goes around comes around. And we have seen a fair bit of hypocrisy this time from uh, those people who were heavily critical of uh, First Nations or uh, First Nations protesters, uh, basically giving a green light to any level of disruption from trucker convoy protests. People have a right to state their views. They do not have the right to disrupt other people's lives indefinitely. Uh, that used to be a conservative position. And it's something that if the leaders are seen to be encouraging lawlessness, uh, not only will Mr. Trudeau or Ms. Freeland try to hang it on them in the next election, but they will invite other groups from the other end of the political spectrum to do exactly the same thing to them uh, should they ever win an election. And so there has to be uh, there has to be a way of balancing the right of people to have their say uh, in a in a civil, if enthusiastic manner, uh, without uh, putting people's uh, job security or uh, uh, occupational uh, you know ca capacity to do their jobs at risk. And uh, some of the protest groups have done a better job at that than others. Okay, that's very interesting. Thanks for sharing that there, Dr. Hale. And thanks so much also for being with us today. We are out of time, but uh, we always appreciate you coming on. My pleasure. Dr. Jeffrey Hale is Professor Emeritus with the University of Lethbridge. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks for watching.